Okay, so today's webinar is the second part of our uh, webinar series on lymphedema management. Um, last time we went over some basics, an overview of the anatomy and physiology of the lymphatic system. We talked about uh, diagnosing between primary and secondary lymphedema um, and the management through uh, complete decongestive therapy, which is what we're going to be uh, focusing on for our uh, management skills. Um, and today we're, I'm going to go over a little more detailed anatomy and physiology. And the reason this is important for you to understand is because when we're doing our manual lymph drainage, we need to understand the anatomy and physiology of the lymphatic system so that we can direct the fluid in the places we want it to go. Um, and that's a very important skill for all of us to understand and um, be able to perform. So after that, we'll talk about um, when the lymphatic system, when the management using CDT, complete decongestive therapy, um, what kind of cautions and contraindications there are for doing that type of therapy, um, as well as um, some education. If we have time, we'll go over some education on exercise, um, exercise as part of the therapy, as well as some uh, education on uh, skin treatment and care. Um, our next webinar um, will be focusing more on the manual lymph drainage and the bandaging and the compression garments itself. So um, let's get started with today's webinar, which will start with some anatomy. Um, so as you can see here, um, you've all seen this diagram before of all the components of the lymphatic system. We um, can see here that there's we have our lymphatic system running through our whole body under the skin, and we have lymph nodes, which is identified here. Um, these are the inguinal lymph nodes, which are the main component for filtering the lymphatic fluid and concentrating the proteins. Uh, we have our spleen, thymus gland, um, which, is, which are important immuno, immunological functions. And then we have this big um, lymphatic duct, which is called the thoracic duct, which is taking the lymph fluid from the lower half of the body and the uh, left arm and taking it up into, and returning it back to the uh, venous circulation. So we have lymph vessels, lymph nodes, and all the rest of the um, important lymph, um, lymphatic system uh, organs that you can read about here. And then we have the lymphatic system function, which the main functions of the lymphatic system are to take the water and the protein that comes out of the circulatory <laughs> system into the, into the extracellular space and return it back to the vein, uh, up at the um, at the venous system, up 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 in the neck, and that's important, and that's why we always start our manual lymph drainage with a, a series on the neck. The other function of the lymphatic system is to absorb protein, fat, and fat soluble vitamins, which are called chyle, um, through the intestine. And there's there are hundreds of lymph nodes in the deep intestine and this is their primary job. And then of course, the lymphatic system is known for uh, responding and recognizing to foreign cells, cancer cells, and serving as immunological function. So um, you've all seen this diagram before. It's very, um, it shows very clearly that, you know, we've got all these uh, lymph vessels from different tributary regions We've got lymph vessels under the skin that run to the to the axilla. We've got um, lymph nodes from the chest running over to the axilla, and so all the lymph all the lymph um, tri uh, capillaries are going in a direction and in, in a specific direction towards lymph nodes. And the reason for that is because they want to take the, all that lymph fluid and run it through the lymph nodes to to filter it and. Uh, concentrate the proteins and then those then go deeper and get transported in in different uh, trunks so here you can see you know you have some lymph 
uh, capillaries and you'll see that they're running in different directions and when they get to a certain point they change directions and we call those areas watersheds and I'm going to show you a little video um, that talks about what these watershed areas are and why they're important. Um, we've all seen this diagram in the last webinar and you know this is just an important diagram because it shows you how interconnected the veins and the arteries are with the lymphatic system. In this, in this picture the veins and the arteries are shown in red and blue and the lymphatic system is shown in green. So you have your skin at the top with your, your blood vessels running right underneath and then you've got your, your uh, subcutaneous lymphatic capillaries running right under there and they're taking that fluid that's coming out from the blood circulation and they're taking that fluid and proteins and they're, they're running it deeper and down further into the collectors until all the way down until uh, the collector is way down here and, and underneath the skin and then that those collectors are then taking that fluid and, and further down into the trunks. So this is a nice diagram if you have time to go through it. Um, again, showing you how the transport happens of the capillaries all the way from the skin underneath through this network of capillaries and down into the trunks and then finally to the lymph nodes. And this is where at the lymph node you're going to get the concentration of those proteins. Um, and that happens because you have these uh, lymph vessels that are leaving the lymph node taking away excess water at times. And we'll also go over seeing how this lymph system is running parallel to our systemic circulation. So they both run side by side and that's how our body is able to clear extra fluid from it in a normal situation. And then we'll go over how that happens when um, the body isn't functioning normally and why we end up getting edema or lymphedema. So I think I'm going to show you a little video right now um, and we'll just start that. Now we want to take a closer look at lymphatic watersheds. And when we talk about lymphatic watersheds, we're going to use diagrams that look and feel already familiar to you. Lymphatic watersheds refer to the superficial lymphatic system. The definition of a lymphatic watershed is that the lymphatic watershed delineates or separates lymphatic tributary regions. So if we look at the first and most important watersheds in the body, we are looking at a vertical watershed that separates the left and the right side of the body. And that watershed we call median sagittal watershed. Another important watershed is the transverse watershed which basically separates the lymphatic system from an upper part of the body to a lower part of the body. And when you look at these two very significant watersheds, the median sagittal watershed and the transverse watershed, these watersheds already separate the trunk in four quadrants. So here you see an upper right quadrant, an upper left quadrant, a right lower quadrant, and a left lower quadrant. These are the most important watersheds, but there are some others which we would also like to discuss. One goes along the clavicle and it basically separates the tributary regions of the upper trunk quadrants to the head and neck. So the idea is that lymph fluid in the right and left upper quadrants would go to the right and left axillary lymph nodes respectively and lymph fluid in the head and neck region 
would go to the cervical lymph nodes and eventually into the larger lymph trunks. In the back, we have an equivalent to the clavicle watershed, but we call it spine of the scapular watershed. So the spine of the scapular watershed separates the upper trunk quadrants in the back to the neck region. And while we are at the back, we also want to mention the gluteal watershed. Of all the five watersheds that I just mentioned, the gluteal watershed to me personally is the least important one. But what it does, it separates the direction of lymph collectors in respect to the inguinal lymph nodes. So when you look at the gluteal area and we follow that watershed, lymph fluid that is absorbed into the lymphatic vessels on the outside of the gluteal watershed will eventually flow into the inguinal lymph nodes around the pelvic area to the front, where lymph collectors that originate medial from the gluteal watershed will also transport lymphatic fluid to the inguinal lymph nodes, but it goes through the perineum area into the inguinal lymph nodes. So the watershed that we call CHAPS or gluteal watershed does not really separate a lymphatic tributary region because on the outside and on the inside of that watershed, it goes to the inguinal lymph nodes, but it actually separates the direction of flow. And I want you to be careful. All right, so that was a, a little video that um, went over the watersheds and we'll just um, quickly talk about that again. So the watersheds are, um, you know, there's five watersheds and they're important because they will take the, um, the body and divide it into four different quadrants, which are also called tributary regions. And those are really, really important when, we, when we're talking about manual lymph drainage later on. Um, this diagram is showing you how the lymph gets into uh, the lymph, the, the small lymph vessels. Um, and here you see a collapsed lymph, and then when the fluid around that lymph is, there's a greater pressure in that fluid around the lymph, there's some anchoring filaments that will pull open these uh, areas of the lymph, and you'll get lymph flow into, the, into those little capillaries, and then, and then that lymph will then, this valve will open, and that lymph will then move through the body. Um, this is a, a diagram showing the different layers of the lymph, lymph capillaries, um, and it also talks, and we'll also talk about the lymph angions, and you can see them here in, the, in these x-rays, that how the lymph is, the fluid is going through these, um, all these capillaries and moving in a direction, in a specific direction. The lymph angion, like you can see here, there, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a small unit inside the lymph, and these, these vessels, when they get dilated, they, the valves open up, and they, can try, they have their own, um, their own system through the autonomic nervous system, which is then going to push that, that lymph in, in one direction um, when the valves open, and the lymph fluid is going to go through and move up the body. In the, in the direction that that lymph is flowing. So we talked about these watershed areas. You have your big median sagittal watershed, which divides the body in half. And then the second most important watershed is the transverse watershed, which is running across, uh, like in the video, across the body, dividing the body into four separate quadrants. And we have our major um, lymph nodes, which are going to be in your uh, inguinal areas and also your axillary areas. And that's where 
those those quadrants are important because the fluid is going to those four areas uh, to drain the upper limbs and the lower limbs. So we, I'm not going to show you this, this diagram which talks about anastomoses. And anastomoses just means the pathways or the connections between the, those, important, those four important quadrants. So you have your watershed here, your uh, transverse watershed that's separating the upper limb and the lower limb on the left side. But we have this natural connection that we use, this anastomosis pathway, and we're going to try and break down this watershed so that we're going to try and direct fluid from one pathway from the inguinal to the axillary pathway or back down in either direction. So this anastomosis, we would call that the axillo-inguinal anastomosis. And sometimes when we, when we say we're working on an anastomosis, we'll um, call it whatever it's called based on the direction that the, the, the two uh, areas that we're trying to connect together. So we're going to break down this, this watershed using our techniques um, in order to create a, a natural connection here. And this will help us to direct fluid away from an area that has too much fluid. Let's say there is too much, um, there was too much edema in the left lower extremity. We can try and direct that fluid to the upper ex upper extremity, uh, to the upper chest through this anastomosis. Same thing. There is another anastomosis that we can create between uh, each of the axillary nodes. And we would call that the axillary, axillary, or AA anastomosis. So again, the fluid would run, if, if we had too much fluid in the left arm, we would use this anastomosis and try to break down this uh, watershed area and try to move the fluid over to the other side. Any questions so far about the watershed areas or any of the anastomosis pathways? pretty clear so far we can continue okay so um, I'm gonna now show you a nice little video uh, that talks about this diagram which we've all seen before um, that that goes over the lymph lymphatic trunks so bear with me one second I'm just gonna find that Now, having dealt with the I would like you to pay attention to the blue blood vessels illustrated in this diagram. One is the left and the right subclavian vein, and another one of those <laughs> vascular structures is the internal jugular vein on the right and the left side. Eventually these veins merge into a very large vein in our body which is the vena cava superior. So these will lend us a reference when it comes to the upper thorax and the neck region. Another reference that we see here in this diagram is the diaphragm. The diaphragm which roughly in our diagram and for the purpose of the lymphatic system separates the upper part from the lower part of the body. So if I drew a comparison to the superficial lymphatic system, we have the transverse watershed, which basically separates the upper trunk from the lower trunk. Deep inside our body, it's kind of like the diaphragm that we use as our transition between upper part and the lower portion of the body. And we also see a small piece of the intestinal wall showing in this diagram, which will help us to identify a lymph trunk, which comes from the intestinal area and eventually goes into the cisterna chile. But let us start with the largest lymphatic vessel in your body, and that is the thoracic duct. The thoracic duct begins at approximately L2, the second lumbar vertebrae. 
And all of this is anteriorly from the spine. It's deep in the abdomen, but it's still anteriorly from the spinal column. At the second lumbar vertebrae, approximately, this is where we would locate the cisterna chile. The cisterna chile should not completely be separated from the thoracic duct. You should look at the cisterna chile as part of the thoracic duct or the beginning of the thoracic duct in the abdomen. If you now follow the thoracic duct along, it will pierce through the diaphragm and eventually curve around behind the subclavian vein and hook on to the subclavian vein on the left side. So you have that natural connection between the lymphatic system and the venous system at the part of the left subclavian vein. This is the largest lymphatic in your body. If you did any kind of like cadaver dissection and you would closely look at the vasculature inside the thorax, you would possibly be able to identify the thoracic duct with your naked eye. That's how big it is, about, you know, four to five millimeters in diameter. And it goes from L2, follows the thoracic spine to the left subclavian vein. When we look at the lower portion of the body, we should also identify in this diagram the inguinal lymph nodes and the connection between the inguinal lymph nodes and the cisterna chile is to the right and left lumbar trunk. The right and left lumbar trunk really connects the inguinal and pelvic lymph nodes to the cisterna chile. Look at the cisterna chile, which we mentioned is the beginning of the thoracic duct as a collection place for lymph fluid right underneath the diaphragm. So lymph fluid goes from the lower extremity into the inguinal lymph nodes, then a little bit deeper to the pelvic lymph nodes. Once the fluid has passed through those pelvic lymph nodes, sometimes they are called iliac lymph nodes. Here we go again. We have two different words for the same group of lymph nodes. Mm -hmm. So we can say pelvic or iliac lymph nodes. And these iliac lymph nodes are located along the major blood vessels. And eventually the lymphatic vessels coming from those iliac lymph nodes will form the lumbar trunks. And the lumbar trunks will transport fluid into the cisterna chile. Another very important lymphatic trunk in the lower part of the body is the gastrointestinal trunk. Oftentimes we just talk about this and call it the intestinal lymph trunk or intestinal lymph vessels. So what's so important about the gastrointestinal trunk? The intestinal lymph trunk is very important in that it transports fat, fat soluble vitamins from the intestinal area into the cisterna chile and the thoracic duct. And as I mentioned before, the intestinal lymph is sometimes milky white due to the presence of fat. It would only be milky white after the ingestion of long chain fatty acids and fat soluble vitamins. And more of that is discussed in the physiology lecture of the lymphatic system. So when we look at it down below, the big lymph trunks, the lumbar trunks and the gastrointestinal trunk transport fluid into the cisterna chile. And from there, it goes into the thoracic duct, In the thoracic duct eventually links to the left subclavian vein. Now let's take a look at the upper part of the body. In the upper part, I would like to highlight the axillary lymph nodes first to give you an orientation. So the connection between the axillary lymph nodes and the thoracic duct is made through the subclavian trunk on the left. Now, if we take a quick look on the right, we have axillary lymph nodes, we have a subclavian trunk, but instead of going to the thoracic duct, the subclavian trunk 
goes into another lymphatic duct, which we call right lymphatic duct. So there are connections on either side of the venous system, left and right subclavian vein. On the left side, it is the thoracic duct, which creates that natural lymphovenous anastomosis, a connection. On the right side, it is a fairly short, maybe two, three centimeter long lymphatic vessel that we call right lymphatic duct. And the right lymphatic duct would connect to the right subclavian vein or somewhere in this junction between subclavian vein and internal jugular vein, which is also referred to as the venous angle. So there is some Okay, so, so so he was going over the different um, tributary regions and how the lymph fluid is transported from the lymphatic system up into the venous system. And that's why the neck area is very important. And that's an area that we're going to be massaging first because when we do our manual lymph drainage, we want to clear the neck because that is where the fluid is ending up and we're working backwards. So we start with the neck and then we're going to do work in the, in the thorax or in the abdomen, abdominal area. And then finally, we're going to make our way to the area where the fluid is collecting. So the important thing to note from this is that three quarters of the body, the, both the lower extremities and the left arm, all of those areas are, are, are draining into the left subclavian vein. So three quarters of the body will drain onto the left side into the left subclavian vein. And the right upper extremity and this right quadrant is going to drain into the right subclav subclavian vein. So we have two different areas, but most of the lymphatic fluid is being drained on the left side from the body. Okay, moving on. Did anyone have any questions about the lymphatic trunks? No? Okay, we'll move on. Um, so this is a, just a description of everything we went through. Um, the next section is talking about what is in the lymph fluid. We have protein, water, cells, um, primarily lymphocytes. We have waste products and then, of course, fat from the intestinal trunks. There are about 600 to 700 lymph nodes in the human body, and these lymph nodes are an area where we're going to be um, concentrating all those uh, the proteins that are in, in the lymph, and we're trying to filter the lymph nodes and ex uh, expose the lymphatic fluid to our lymphocytes, which are located in the lymph nodes, and those lymphocytes will break down any um, waste products, bacteria, or cancer cells, and trying to get rid of some of the extra um, waste that is, that is in the lymph fluid. So, um, this, th these, um, these charts that are in your handouts are very specific. They talk about where the lymph nodes are and where these lymph nodes, uh, the tributary regions or the area that those lymph nodes are going to work uh, on draining fluid. So you can look at these um, prior to when we when we meet in Nairobi. Um, you can, you know, there's in the axillary lymph nodes, as you can see, there's 25 or 30 nodes on each side. So, you know, when somebody has breast cancer and they remove one of those low, uh, nodes, um, you know, there are other nodes that will pick up the lymph fluid, but there aren't so many that perhaps if somebody, someone has five or seven lymph nodes removed, it can really affect how that lymph is being um, taken out of the upper extremity on that side. We have lymph nodes in our, in our pectoral region and in the elbow, in the cubital fossa. And then the lower extremity we've got, as he mentioned, you have your inguinal lymph nodes, you have your pelvic lymph nodes, your iliac lymph nodes. Um, the superficial inguinal lymph nodes are the ones that are um, about 10 of them, and they're very superficial. They're, they're right near the groin over the iliac ligament. 
So we'll be palpating those and uh, learning how to clear those lymph nodes. And then, of course, we have some in behind your knee as well. So let's now talk about the difference between lymph flow and blood flow. So you can see in this diagram, it looks very similar. The green is the lymphatic flow. Um, the red and the blue is the blood flow. Uh, you have your red, the red is the arteries, and then you've got your blue, um, the veins in the body. And they run similar to each other. They run through the whole body. But as you can see, the lymphatic uh, flow is going through these lymph nodes and as we saw in the video, you're going to get your lymph nodes from the lower extremities going up and into the cisterna chile, which is a collection place, place that will then take the fluid through the major duct, which is the thoracic duct, bring it up behind the subclavian vein, and then dump it back into the main um, subclavian vein on the left in the neck area. So the difference between the two is the lymphatic system is a one-way system. So you have fluid being moved through intrinsic cont uh, contractions of the lymph collectors, and it's not a continuous uh, column. It's a, it's a one-way column that's taking fluid from the extremities or the head and neck area and moving it up back into the circulatory system. You're only getting about two to four liters of lymph fluid being moved per day, Whereas if you look at the blood circulatory system, it's a circular system. It's the blood is being circulated uh, in a circular fashion through the whole body. And, and that fluid, that amount of blood is a lot more. You're getting about 7,200 7, liters of blood being circulated through the day. And we have our heart and um, being used as our, the pump for the blood. Uh, as well as when we're standing, we have our calf muscle pumps, which is contraction of the muscles, which are helping to push the blood around um, in the body. So on the, on the blood side, we have a continuous column of fluid. It's moving in a circular fashion. Um, and the difference between the, uh, the other difference between the two is the peripheral lymphatic pressure. It's unaffected by how, if you're, if you're standing or, or if you're lying down. The lymph angions have their own um, pressure and they're gonna be contracting six to 10 times per minute, regardless of if you're standing or sitting. Um, whereas the blood circulation is very different if you're, if you're lying down or if you're standing up. Uh, when we're standing up, the venous pressure goes down significantly, and we need to use, again, our calf muscle pumps to help bring that pressure back. Um, if you have a, an obstruction in the lymphatic system, that's going to lead to a collection of high-protein fluid uh, in, the, in the body, whereas if you have an obstruction of the blood circulatory system, you're going to have a collection of low-protein pl fluid. So with the lymphatic system, if there's an injury, you're going to see a long time before you're going to see an effect or a clinical appearance uh, occur. Whereas in the blood system, you're going to see that um, you're also it'll be different. You're going to see a low protein fluid, but like for if you for instance, if you have chronic venous insufficiency, you might see a different kind of presentation, but it'll also have a long latency period. Um, the lymph fluid, as we talked about earlier, is filtered by lymph nodes, whereas the blood circulation is filtered by the kidneys and the liver. So uh, your handout goes over different um, diagrams of lymph nodes. Uh, this is a picture of the cervical lymph nodes, which are usually a little bit bigger, and sometimes if they get swollen, you can feel them. Um, then there's a deeper system. We've got our axillary and parasternal lymph nodes, which um, can be in three different layers. Um, you can have the superficial ones and then the pectoral ones, and then finally the deeper axillary lymph nodes. Um, we have lymph nodes even in, in our chest wall, um, the intercostal lymph nodes. And this uh, is a diagram that, again, on x-ray you can see how these lymph vessels are moving in different directions at the watershed area. You have, you have little, little dividers also in your arm that um, 
have the fluid moving in different directions, but ultimately they're all trying to get back up to the axillary lymph nodes. And in the lower extremity, we have the same thing, the inguinal lymph nodes, which are superficial, and then the pelvic lymph nodes, which are deeper. Um, and again, they're trying to drain the fluid from the lower extremity and into the, into the inguinal lymph nodes and the pelvic lymph nodes that will then go up into the thoracic duct. So here's a, here's a, a picture of a cadaver where you can see they've taken the skin off and you can see the vessels in the, of the lymphatic system right under the skin. And here's some diagrams, some x-rays that, that, that are showing some lymphatic vessels, again, moving in the lower extremities. Um, and they did some, um, some lymphatic imaging showing the lymphatic system. So I'm going to, just in summary, show you one more short video uh, that talks about the lymph nodes. Concentration and filtration of lymph in the nodes. On its way towards the blood circulation, the lymph passes through several nodes, which are often situated in groups. The first node of such a group is the sentinel node. The nodes fulfill important immunological functions. They filter out cellular debris bacteria and cancer cells from the lymph. The debris and bacteria are then phagocytosed by immune cells such as macrophages. The cancer cells are attacked by specific cellular elements. Lymph usually becomes concentrated in the nodes through the reabsorption of water the water is carried away by the nodal veins. On the other hand, in cases of venous hypertension, water is added to the lymph in the nodes. Okay, so we will now move on to the physiology part um, of the lecture. One second here. Does anyone have any questions about the um, anatomy section? Right now, no? Okay, so now we're going to talk about the lymphatic system and its functions. We already uh, mentioned this a little bit. Um, so we know that the lymphatic system is returning protein and extra water or filtrate from the systemic circulation and um, it is then taking it back to the venous circulation. Um, it absorbs fat and fat-soluble vitamins from the small intestine, and it provides immune surveillance by recognizing and responding to foreign cells and viruses and cancer cells. So three main functions. Um, we can now talk about what is the lymphatic load. So the lymphatic load is primarily going to be consisting of protein, water, cells, and fat. Um, and we talked about where this is coming from. We're going to talk a little more in detail about um, how the body uh, is able to respond to increased load, lymphatic load. So there's a few different things in this diagram that are important to note. Um, the, the line at the bottom is the lymphatic load and the amount of time that it takes for the body to um, dispose of that load is called lymph time volume. Then we have what's called the transport capacity. So the transport capacity, the transport capacity is the maximum amount of um, lymph that the body could, and the amount of time, the lymph time volume, the maximum amount the body is able to transport. 
So you can see there's a big difference here. Um, the, normally the body will, the lymph time volume will be about four liters per day in humans. Um, but that's only about 10% of what the maximum transport capacity is. And the space in between is called the functional reserve. So that means that if there was to be an increase in the load for the, in the lymphatic system, then there's a, uh, this is a safety, um, this is a safety mechanism in the body and the lymphatic, the lymph time volume will increase and the body will be able to transport a little more lymphatic load by increasing the lymph time volume. And that just reduces this functional reserve space that's left in the body. So this is important clinically because sometimes the patient um, will tell us that their body feels he or their limb feels heavy or there's an achiness. And that just means that perhaps there's an increased lymphatic load and, and the tissues are, are taking up a little more lymph. And even you might not see the swelling yet, but you might have a little more lymph being transported in that limb. Um, if you look at this picture, you can see this is um, the fluid is coming out of the capillary and into this extracellular space. And when these fibers get filled with more um, with more filtrate, that's when it, it, it appears to the patient as if there's an aching or a heaviness in that arm. And you can think of this more like um, this space is more like jello, where the, the proteins are kind of like fruit in that jello, and the jello is the extracellular space that's holding all that fruit together. So when a patient feels like this is this area seems fuller then they're going to they're going to complain of of their arm or their leg feeling achy or heavy and that's you might not see the changes in the skin at that time they might just be telling you that they're feeling this heaviness and that's a sign of increased lymphatic load so you know what what causes what are the reasons that you get this increased lymphatic load there's different reasons. There's a few main reasons why that happens. One is the blood capillary permeability. So there might be a change in how permeable the me membrane of the uh, capillary is. So you might get a little more filtrate coming out. Um, and the exchange that happens between the, the blood and the extracellular space um, we talked about it last time. It's mostly through diffusion. And there's a principle called Starling's principle that we talked about last time. And according to Starling, um, I showed you this picture last time, the amount of um, fluid coming out of the, of the arterial side is initially they thought that that's the same amount that was getting reabsorbed on the venous side, and then there was a small amount that would come, be left over, which was called the lymph. Um, however, there is a revised um, Starling um, uh, theory now, and, and, it, and it just shows that more often than not, this plasma osmotic pressure, the pressure inside the blood capillary, um, on the arterial side, you are getting fluid being um, filtrated out but there isn't as much reabsorption as they, as they once thought. So that extra fluid that comes out of the blood capillary is all being, um, being taken up by the lymphatic system. So here you can see the initial uh, Starling principle, you see filtrate coming out and resorption on the, on the venous side, but the new theory shows more that there's just uh, filtration going out the whole way and then the lymphatic system is taking that uh, fluid back to the venous system at in the neck so um, here again is a picture of the um, pr the blood pressure as you can see starting on the on in the aorta and moving down into the veins and I'm gonna show you a little video right now um, that talks about why this pressure is important and how it, it, it contributes to lymphatic flow. So bear with me one second and I will start the video. Anybody have any questions so far? Is everything pretty clear? 
Yes, please, you can proceed. Change based on capillary dynamics. In your manual, you see a diagram of normal blood pressure. And you see, and you already, of course, know that the normal blood pressure in a healthy individual would fluctuate between 120 and 80 millimeters mercury. And when you follow this diagram, you see very easily that there is a very non-substantial drop in the arterial blood pressure as the blood flows through the air water, the large arterials, or even the smaller arteries. But remarkably, just before we enter the capillary, the most significant reduction in blood pressure happens at the level of the pre-capillary arterials. And I want to mention here that the pre-capillary arterials are very rich in smooth muscle fibers. By comparison, the pre-capillary arterials are stronger than the air water. And I do want to be clear on it that I know the difference between the air water that you can see very easily with your naked eye and a pre-capillary arterial, which would need to be magnified in order to really appreciate it visually. But in proportion, the pre-capillary arterial is stronger and has more muscle than the air water. So these are very strong little tiny blood vessels that have the ability to reduce the blood pressure from the normal blood pressure of an average of 100 down to about 30 millimeter mercury before the arterial blood enters into the blood capillaries. Remember that blood capillaries do not have muscle tissue in their wall. And therefore, if they were perfused with a much, much greater pressure, they would simply not withstand the pressure and could possibly burst. So the pre-capillary arterials are very, very important in controlling how much blood pressure goes into the capillaries. Then, of course, if you follow the blood pressure curve into the venules and the small veins, to the larger veins, and eventually to the inner cava, you will see that the blood pressure reduces to about 2 to 4 millimeter, could even sometimes be negative pressure in the larger or the largest veins in our body. Why is this important? Why did we talk about blood pressure, blood capillary pressure, and how that blood pressure is actually reduced so the blood capillary pressure is less? It is very important because there are fluctuations in the muscle tone of the pre-capillary arterials. And just imagine for a moment when the pre-capillary arterials, maybe we go back to the diagram one more time, if the pre-capillary arterials constrict, there would be less blood flow into the capillaries and the blood capillary pressure, of course, would be reduced. Now, that's one scenario that would happen in our peripheral capillaries when we get cold. We would actually kind of like see a constriction of the blood capillaries and less blood volume in the capillaries means less blood capillary pressure and less filtration. Less filtration would actually be easy on the lymphatics because it would have less work to do. But how is it when we turn it to the opposite and we actually look at a dilation of the precapillary arterial? And I want to refer to another set of diagrams which show normal capillary filtration and perfusion and increased capillary perfusion. When the pre-capillary arterioles dilate, there's a potential for more blood volume to go into the capillary. More blood volume in the capillary also means a greater amount of pressure in the capillaries. And I know I've been tossing around the uh, terms blood capillary pressure and hydrostatic pressure on the capillaries. These are the same, but I really want you to get familiar with both terms, so I'm tossing them around it and use them interchangeably. But remember that hydrostatic pressure in the capillaries is the same as blood capillary pressure. So as the pre-capillary arterials dilate or blood volume goes into the capillaries, hydrostatic pressure increases and so does filtration. Any increase in filtration on the capillary level as a consequence will trigger more lymphatic how do we get a dilation of the precapillary arterials? The examples that I'm going to give you right now are very easy to understand. It could be massage. 
if we are massaging the tissues in a certain way, we will cause hyperemia. Hyperemia is active hyperemia, and there's more blood supply in the capillaries. Again, more blood supply in the capillaries will trigger more filtration and increase lymphatic load. We can also find examples of exercise. If you are now becoming more active and you are increasing your circulatory system, you will actually decrease blood capillary volume, you will increase filtration, and based on everything that we have already discussed, you'll understand that you will decrease lymphatic load. Another clinical example that I want to show you here is patients with inflammation. This patient that you see now on the screen is suffering an infection from cellulitis. And her tissues on the one lower extremity are very, very red. But remarkable in this picture, if you look very closely, even though this patient has bilateral lower extremity lymphedema, you see that one side, the side that has the inflammation, that side that is now being infected, has more swelling. There is more volume in that tissue, you can almost appreciate that the right lower extremity is not quite as large as the left lower extremity. And even though in clinical examples of lymphedema, you will always find an asymmetry between the two different sides of lymphedema in the same individual, you can almost appreciate here in this diagram that the right side looks less swollen and perhaps already even to some degree decongested from treatment. And the left leg or the left lower extremity is more significantly swollen, perhaps as a result of the active hyperemia in inflammation. Now we need to look at passive hyperemia. Passive hyperemia is not exactly opposite of active hyperemia, so we need to kind of like be a little cautious here. Again, I want to refer to a diagram in your book, which actually shows a normal capillary perfusion and how the capillary perfusion change in passive hyperemia. Passive hyperemia is caused by a venous obstruction or poor venous return. To some degree, there is less than optimal flow in the venous system. And you can see by looking at the diagram that the blood has now backed up into the capillary beds. As a consequence of that passive hyperemia, we have an increase in blood capillary pressure, and therefore we will experience an increase in capillary filtration. The result will be an increase in lymphatic load. So what I would like to think about is that active hyperemia and passive hyperemia lead to the same result, which is an increase or at least a potential increase in lymphatic load, but they are caused by two completely different mechanisms. One is the dilation of the precapillary arterial, which allows more blood volume to enter into the capillary the other is caused by a venous obstruction or a poor sluggish venous return and a backup of fluid into the capillary beds. I would like to give you some clinical examples of patients with passive hyperemia. A very classic example would be an example of a deep venous thrombosis. In a deep venous thrombosis, we have a very sudden blockage of venous return and therefore a potential increase in capillary pressure and increase in lymphatic load. But the patients that I picked here actually display a different pathology. The patient here on the lower extremity looks like he has lymphedema and in fact, he was actually diagnosed by the physician as a patient with lymphedema for complete decongestive therapy. The practitioner, the lymphedema therapist who received that patient, recognized by looking at the patient as a whole that this edema is not caused by lymphatic failure, but rather caused by congestive heart failure. 
So the edema that you see here is solely based on passive hyperemia because the cardiovascular system was not able to carry the load. Fluid backs up into the venous system. Eventually, the fluid backs up into the capillary system and the capillary beds, causes increased blood capillary pressure, increased filtration, and eventually an increase in lymphatic load. Now, in the example of this patient where you already see bilateral lower extremity swelling, you can easily assume that the lymphatic system, even though it has responded with a safety factor and certainly pumped as much fluid as possible back into the cardiovascular system, was unable to cope with the amount of lymphatic fluid or we could say unable to cope with capillary filtration. The other picture that I want to show you here is of a patient with upper extremity lymphedema. And that's very important to know that this upper extremity lymphedema was already existent prior to this degree of swelling. So the patient had upper extremity edema, but suddenly develop a deep venous thrombosis in the subclavian vein, and the swelling became massive. In comparison to the other arm, the swelling is very substantial, and oftentimes swelling from deep venous thrombosis, whether it's in the subclavian vein or in one of the larger veins of your lower extremity, can be very painful. So while a lay person knowing a little bit about lymphedema may say, oh, this patient has lymphedema from axillary surgery and radiation. We need to look past that. And if the patient displays a fairly recent onset of swelling or an exacerbation, a recent exacerbation of the swelling and perhaps pain associated to it, we need to think about the thrombosis as well. And that's why I picked this patient, because most of their swelling is not from actual classic lymphedema. It is actually from deep venous thrombosis. And therefore, I need to caution you, this patient will be treated differently and not right away with complete decongestive therapy. The reason I gave those two examples, because they are classic for patients who develop swelling as a result of increased capillary filtration, and increased lymphatic load. So while okay, so um, we'll go back to the lecture. So um, this is the diagram he went over with you, showing the thicker wall in the arteries versus the veins. Um, and how when you constrict, you have active hyperemia or a constriction of the arterial side, you're going to get a constriction in the capillary network. Um, but on the other side, if you're going to um, get a, a dilation of these vessels, you're going to get increased lymphatic load because there'll be more filtration happening through the capillary network. Um, and then he talked about passive hyperemia, so, and that would be if there was congestive heart failure or a DVT, or maybe there's a tumor growth and there's, a, you know, a, a decreased, uh, decreased venous flow, then you're going to get a backing up of the blood into the tissues. Um, the third condition that might increase um, our lymphatic load would be hypoproteinemia, which is a condition where there's abnormally low level of protein in the blood. Um, so because there's a decrease in the plasma protein, that's going to increase your filtration again. Um, so this can be caused by malnutrition, malabsorption, or oftentimes when there's the patient has liver disease or the proteins are not being made in the liver properly, um, or a renal disease. So here you can see the patient hyperproteinemia. You'll often see this presentation uh, where their upper body is looking pretty normal size, and then they'll get an increased size in the lower extremities and the trunk. So the three different conditions that are going to increase the load are active hyperemia, passive hyperemia, or hypoproteinemia. Any questions about those three conditions?
from anybody? Is that pretty clear? No question. Okay, so now why is the, why are those conditions important? So if we go back to our diagram, and this is when we end up having edema, is you have your lymph time volume that increases because of the load, and if it actually exceeds or hits that transport capacity or the maximum amount of load, then you're going to start to see edema forming. Um, so low output failure is one condition that happens in lymphedema, and that means if there's a, a problem with the lymphatic system, there's a failure, then you're going to have the original transport capacity is going to be lowered, and whatever lymph is in there in the system, it it's going to um, over overload the system because your initial transport capacity has gone down, and you're going to end up with lymphatic vessels um, being um, being overloaded and lymphedema. So this could be what what can cause this. This can be caused by um, primary lymphedema where the transport capacity is lower. There's a tumor growth or there's scarring from surgery or radiation. That's going to take your transport capacity and bring it down. And then that's going to um, give a, make a problem with the lymphatic load and cause lymphedema. That's called low output failure. Um, the high output failure I already talked about is when there's lymphatic load that increases. Um, maybe this is because there's um, hyper hyperactive hyperemia or passive hyper passer, passive hyperemia, where the lymphatic load increases and goes past the transport capacity. And then we can have a situation where there's it's called combined lymphatic insufficiency, so a mixture of high and low output failure. Um, so two examples of that would be someone who has congestive heart failure and then their lymphatic load increases um, and can cause high output failure. If the condition becomes chronic, the lymphatic system can, can get tired and develop low output failure, which is when you're going to get this crossover between the high and the low um, uh, combined lymphatic insufficiency. Or, like I mentioned earlier, if a patient has primary lymphedema in the lower extremity and then they develop uh, chronic, chronic venous insufficiency or congestive heart failure, um, then your transport capacity gets reduced because of the primary lymphedema and then your uh, lymphatic load increases because of um, the, the congestive heart failure or the CVI. So finally, you know, we talked about this last time, and I'll just go over it very briefly. Um, there is a difference between edema and lymphedema. Um, edema occurs primarily in the extracellular department, and it, it can be postoperatively. Um, usually it's, it resolves once the injury or the problem resolves, um, and there's, there's the same increased filtration from... Um, from the tissues, but it, it usually um, is, it's generally um, bilateral, um, it concerns the whole body. Um, it could be in one part of the body if there is trauma, but usually it uh, it's, uh, concerns the whole body or bilateral. Um, so you can see this from like um, congestive heart failure, you'll see both legs affected. Um, and, and lymphedema it develops when um, as we talked about, if there's low output failure, damaged lymphatic system, or if, if a patient's had surgery, lymph nodes removed, or radiation, or some type of dysplasia to the lymphatic system, then you're going to get lymphedema. Is everyone pretty clear about lymphedema versus um, edema? Um, and, and, you know, it, it's, a, it's a pretty gray area. Sometimes we need to use our clinical reasoning. Um, to try and figure out which which one it is, but um, you know, typically you can you can if, if they have more bilateral edema, then or they've just had surgery and it's still post-op, then that's not lymphedema. That's edema that's going to resolve. Whereas lymphedema is a disease. It, um, it's more chronic and it's not going to really go away because it's a problem with the lymphatic system. So, um, yes? 
I, I have a, a suggestion maybe. Yes. By the time you are coming down to do the training, is it possible for Nairobi to organize if we can get to see these patients, whether it's in, in the wards, uh, so that we can be able to appreciate the difference between active, passive, and hypoprotein. Sure. Um, Victoria, is this something you think that you would be able to organize in Nairobi? Uh, as you, we had discussed before, the training is supposed to end on 19. Huh? That's correct, yeah. So, Fatma, we actually have one day built in. Um, we have one day built in and on the last day of the training for us to look at patients that Victoria is going to organize. Um, but primarily, um, one of the goals of having those patients come in is to um, work on them, do, do some of our manual lymph drainage and our bandaging and, and practice um, on those patients. But definitely, you know, you will get a chance to see some um, see some patients and depending on what Victoria has uh, currently that she can she can bring in for us the, the type of patients I'm not sure what what exactly we're gonna see okay um, my, my request is I know she, she might have prepared uh, patients to see who are already on lymphedema program uh, for outpatients but uh, my request is for in patients I don't know how possible it is if she can liaise with uh, some of the consultants uh, and maybe we are able to see these patients who have these different kinds of edema so that we are able to differentiate and maybe diagnose and maybe or maybe look at it and be able to differentiate between the lymphedema and the edema. Okay. Okay. Maybe for the inpatient, Fatima might be a bit, a bit difficult here. Mm -hmm. Being that uh, most of the patients, of course, they have their specialists and it's like for them to be authorized, you know, to go through the treatment and all that, you have to go through the specialists, which of course becomes a bit tricky. While the outpatient ones are usually referred also through the oncology unit, which is where we have quite a number of patients coming to us. So I, I believe that the kind of clients I have, we will be able to learn and maybe be able to differentiate whether it's a lymphedema or lymphedema. Because I have quite a number of patients, uh, I'm, I'm targeting actually to have like eight patients, which I don't know whether well, that will be a large number or I need to reduce it. And Sorry, so far, how I Victoria, how many patients? Eight. Eight patients. So, you know, we won't have time to treat all eight patients, um, but, you know, we can definitely have them come in. We can feel, we can assess them, um, if it, uh, but primarily, We'll probably, I can talk to you about this later. We can go over their history a little bit and, and decide which ones are most appropriate for treatment in terms of the training. Um, I think maybe, you know, in one day we can probably treat maybe two or three patients um, because we're, we're going to want to talk about it um, as, we're, as we're treating them. Um, so we won't have time to do all eight um, but we can definitely see those patients and do a, little, a quick assessment if that's what you feel will uh, help the team. So do we, because for now the patients which I want to schedule will only be coming on 19th. Yes. And the last day, do I maybe bring some on Wednesday and others on Thursday, or do I just bring all of them on Thursday? Let me get back to you on that. I'll talk to you offline about that, and we'll we'll coordinate it. Uh, we might be able to do one or two at the end of the day on Wednesday, but let me let me talk to you about that on offline, and we'll figure out the schedule. Okay. Okay. Fatma, my, my thoughts, uh, I'm I'm thinking, you know, like uh, for for the patient, I'll prefer maybe if we get an opportunity, all of us to. To, to see a patient, yeah. but not learn from just looking at somebody doing, but at least we do a return demonstration to the patient. So I, I think the, the eight numbers, the eight patients she has, I think it's a good number we can pick from that. So, you know, Fatma, from my experience, um, you know, even having a few patients there, um, first of all, if you have, you know, six therapists, 
who are coming to the training, um, not everybody will be able to treat the patients all together, maybe half of you, even if we had two or three patients. But more importantly, I think it's um, going to be working, watching, uh, watching the instructor work with the patients and then you getting a feel for doing it. Um, uh, you can feel the difference before and after on the lymphedema. Um, but we will try our best to work it out so that you do get some hands-on time with the patient. Okay? Okay. So yeah, that's okay. Okay. So we have. Do you guys have any other questions about um, what we just discussed in the physiology section? So this is just a nice summary of how uh, lymphedema and edema is formed. Either there's going to be four different ways. Basically, if you have increased capillary hydrostatic pressure, that's going to increase your filtration. Um, if you have hyperproteinemia or decreased plasma protein, if you have increased capillary permeability, or if you have a blockage of lymphatic return, which is when you're going to have the lymphedema. So these are just, uh, you can read through these different conditions um, that cause these problems. Uh, capillary hydrostatic pressure, you can have that from extra salt or uh, water retention. Um, if you exercise and get active hyperemia, or if there's high venous pressure. Those will all call, cause capillary hydrostatic pressure. Um, decreased plasma proteins, hyperproteinemia. Uh, it could be a loss of protein from nephro uh, uh, nephrotic disease, a loss of protein from damaged skin, um, or there's a failure, the li li there's liver disease and there's a failure to produce protein. Um, increased ca capillary permeability, um, if you have an immune, re immune response resulting in histamine or other vas vasodilator release, uh, to toxins or bacterial infections. And then finally, blockage of lymphatic return. Um, if there's a blockage of the lymph nodes because of cancer or infection or parasites, scar tissue, something from radiation therapy, or there's a primary lymphedema with dysplasia of the lymphatic system, then you're going to end up with the with the lymph, uh, lymph blockage of lymphatic return. Okay, so if there's no more questions on um, on the physiology, we're going to move on to the next section. Is everyone doing okay? Yes. yes. Okay, so we're going to move on to now. Um, you know, uh, we're going to move on to what we do, and which is complete decongestive therapy. But more importantly, we're going to talk uh, today about when we should not do D uh, CDT. So what is CDT? Manual lymph drainage, compression band bandaging exercise, uh, skin and nail care, and instructions in self-care. So this is what we are going to do when we are encountering somebody with lymphedema or possibly even edema. Um, but we want to be careful about contraindications and when we need to not do CDT. Um, and we're going to go through each of these different areas. So the first one would be if a patient has acute infection or cellulitis. So we're going to avoid compression and manual lymph drainage during the acute phase. Um, and this has more to do with how tolerable they are to, to having this done to them as opposed to how much harm you're doing. So if a patient is really red and uh, really infected and very painful, sensitive skin, they're not going to tolerate your touching them or compressing them um, as well. So usually once they've started on their antibiotics, uh, usually within 24 to 36 hours, once they've started the antibiotics, they can, they'll be able to tolerate uh, MLD again. Um, so many patients, you know, just because they're red doesn't mean that you can't do uh, manual lymph drainage on them. Uh, some people just are, are chronically or they have exacerbations of redness and erythema. So it's just when they have an, an acute infection or a cellulitis happening that we want to uh, hold off for a little bit. Um, congestive heart failure. So usually, like we talked about, congestive heart failure, you're going to see edema, which is symmetric on both sides. You're going to see a soft pitting edema and usually it's worse distally. This is your clinical signs for congestive heart failure along with um, 
you know, this might be a pain, painless response. Uh, they respond to elevation. Uh, but you're going to see some other systemic things like shortness of breath or extreme shortness of breath at night. Um, they're very fatigued. You might hear some, um, you know, on auscultation, you might hear some pulmonary crackles or rawls. And, and this is all that goes with the whole picture of the congestive heart failure. Um, so what we want to determine is whether or not this is an acute um, CHF, it's decompensated or it's chronic. Um, if it's acute, then you want to send them back to their doctor right away. Um, if, if it's chronic or if it's, being, if it's being managed with diuretics, then these patients are okay for us to do our treatment on. Um, so if a patient does have CHF, you want to get medical clearance um, if, if you're not sure, um, if, they're, if they're decompensated. Um, they might need to increase their diuretic dosage. Uh, while you're doing the MLD, they might need to uh, have more diuretics uh, so that they can clear the water that's being produced in their, in their system. Um, you want to do uh, MLD slowly, uh, maybe start slowly and see how they do, monitor their vitals before and after the MLD, make sure the patient symptoms are okay, and then you can maybe con continue with the MLD. Um, and then for compression, we might consider a lighter compression class um, and maybe some fewer layers of bandaging when we're thinking about these patients. Um, another one is acute DVT. Um, if a patient is reporting swelling and pain, um, but oftentimes DVTs are asymptomatic. So if you're suspicious of a DVT, um, you would send that patient back to the doctor to get a Doppler ultrasound done. Um, in an acute DVT, you know, we can still do compression garments and bandaging, but it's the MLD that we need to wait uh, for about six weeks after they've started some sort of treatment, um, if that's a distal DVT. If it's a proximal DVT, then, you know, it's a pelvic DVT, then you, we're going to wait about 12 weeks um, to be, as long as they're cleared by their vascular specialist. Um, so, you know, we, the, the thing you want to be careful with the DVTs is that they're not having a blockage that goes up to the, becomes a pulmonary embolus and goes up to their lungs. Um, renal disorders, this is another caution. Um, again, it's, if a patient has a problem with the return of the extra fluid that we're uh, sending back to the systemic circulation, um, usually, if a patient's on hemodialysis, it's not an issue. You can still do your CDT. Um, but if they have renal insufficiency and they're not on hemodialysis, um, then we want to be cautious again, like like at, same as with chronic um, or congestive heart failure. So just keep that in mind. They might need extra diuretics. They might need to see their nephrologist and get clearance before you can do CDT with these, these guys. Uh, cancer patients, if they have an untreated malignancy, um, you want to wait until their chemo or radiation therapy starts. Um, if a patient has had radiation therapy, you want you want to avoid the irradiated skin. You can do the M uh, MLD around it, um, but you don't want to do it over over the radiated skin. Um, some people are concerned about you know the the chemo drugs being transferred to the therapist. Um, you can avoid that by wearing gloves. Um, with cancer patients, there's a higher risk of DVT. Um, so they might have more coagulation medicine. Uh, you just want to be careful. Um, and, and if it's metastatic disease, um, you do want to do the um, lymph, um, CBT for edema and lymphedema, and even for palliative care, it's um, it's got an analgesic effect. It makes the patient more comfortable. So we are going to treat these patients with caution. Um, so the question is, can manual lymph drainage spread cancer? Um, the answer is unlikely that uh, MLD will cause any metastases as you know, it's very complex with cancer, the chemical interactions physiologically, um, and the tumor is influenced by a, a host of other problems um, more than just uh, our MLD causing that. So regarding neck treatment, um, 
we rarely see an untreated hyperthyroidism, um, but that's when you want to, you want to, that's a contraindication for MLD. Um, if a patient has cardiac arrhythmia or some problem with their carotid sinus, and you want to just be careful with patients who have known or suspected carotid stenosis. So your elderly folk who you suspect carotid stenosis, we got to we got to uh, really be careful with our neck treatment on these patients. Um, car cardiac arrhythmias or carotid sinus. Um, so you know if the patient has uh, uh, pressure causes sympathetic or vagal stimulation. This could lead to bradycardia, exacerbate their heart block. Um, so you want to be careful, you know, uh, men who are greater than 50 years old and ha have carotid hypersensitivity. So what, what you can do to make sure that the patient is okay, these, these patients, you want to take their pulse before and after the MLD um, if you're concerned and see if they're doing okay. Carotid stenosis, again. Um, if a patient has coronary artery disease, they're at risk for carotid disease um, or plaque in their arteries. Um, and the concern would be that you might dislodge the plaque and cause a stroke. So basically, we're going to avoid pressure uh, over the carotid artery with these patients. In the abdomen, if you're going to do um, manual lymph drainage for the abdomen, you would not do it on somebody who's pregnant or who's had recent abdominal surgery. Um, if they've got, uh, if they've had an inflammation uh, in their bladder or or in their colon, um, obviously if they have a pelvic DVT, you want to avoid abdominal MLD, uh, Crohn's disease, uh, any sort of abdominal aor aortic aneurysm, anything that you think is unexplained abdominal pain, we want to avoid the MLD until you've checked it out with their doctor. Um, Usually for the for pregnancy, we're going to not give them constrictive garments either. Um, pretty common sense. Patients are not going to be comfortable. We want to avoid the abdominal MLD. Um, if they have recent abdominal surgery, usually uh, we want to delay the deep MLD for six to eight weeks uh, or maybe more if they've had major surgery, but you want to get clearance from their surgeon. Um, but usually with these patients, the bandaging and the compression garments are, are okay. Um, again, if they have a risk of rupture of the viscera, it increased pain. If they have um, inflammation in their colon or bladder or um, diverticulitis, inflammation, inflammatory bowel disease, again, we're, these are contraindications for abdominal MLD. Um, and we already talked about these. So bandaging. Contraindications for bandaging if they ha if a patient has arterial disease. So this is why we you know we check the toes for perfusion after we bandage the patient, which we'll go over at, when we come do the training in class. Um, and you want to be careful with bandaging people who have neurological conditions, hypertension, or diabetes. Um, not to say you can't do it. You just want to be careful. Maybe you won't do as much bandaging, or maybe you're just going to be more careful in checking them after. Um, so with arterial disease, you have the risk of ischemia uh, with compression bandaging. So ABI is the ankle brachial index, and normally the number that you have is 1.0, and this is something your vascular clinics can tell you if they've done an ABI. And ABI just tells us the difference between um, the arterial uh, pressure in your arm versus the arterial, arterial pressure in your leg. Um, so usually bandaging, if you have a 0.8 or greater ABI, then that's going to be okay. Um, if it's less than that, then you want to check with the vascular clinic if bandaging is going to be okay. Um, if a patient has pain or cyanosis, there's, there's blueness in their extremity after bandaging, then you can quickly take that off and reassess. Uh, for neurological conditions, if the patient's had a stroke or post-polio spinal cord injury, um, you might be careful with the bandaging. Um, if they have chronic, depend in chronic dependency, immobility, possibly an autonomic dysfun dysfunction that are contributing to the swelling, uh, you may not want to do the bandaging then. 
Sensory loss is big. Um, you know, if a person has sensory loss and they can't tell you um, about any, what they're feeling in their skin or in their arm or leg, you want to do frequent skin checks. Maybe we're going to take the bandages off more frequently um, and pad, pad them over their bony um, joints. Um, and, you know, we want to check that they have somebody to help them get the compression garment on and off more frequently. Um, and we're going to, you know, give them more elevation um, protocols. So hypertension, if a patient has hypertension and you're adding more fluid to their circulation, they might have increased blood pressure. Um, and if that's poorly controlled, we might not want to bandage these people. Um, but be, we, we basically want to check their blood pressure before and after we do our CDP. Diabetes, a patient might have arterial disease, peripheral neuropathy, and hypertension. Uh, we want to check their medical history, do a thorough assessment, uh, and, you know, do our vascular and sensory evaluation EMG studies to make sure that this patient um, can tolerate it. And, and basically, we're going to do, again, our vitals before and after our treatment. So when is uh, complete de decongestive therapy uh, fail to be effective? Um, if a patient has malignant lymphedema, it's not going to be very effective. Um, if the patient, if the treatment is insufficient, so if the technique is poor or the bandaging technique is poor or you're not following the proper prot protocol for CDT, then you might not be as effective. Uh, if the patient has comorbidities, obesity or uh, heart conditions, that you, might have, you might see that um, CDT is not going to work very well. Um, if the patient isn't following the program very well, we, is a, you know, there's the intense phase, there's phase one and there's phase two. And we want to explain this to the patient, make them understand that the intense phase is, is a time where they really have to make a commitment to it. And then the maintenance phase, they have to follow through with your recommendations. Or, probably, or there is a chance that the patient just does not have lymphedema and there's some other reason for their edema. And this could be a reason why CDT is not working. So medications, um, we'll talk, talk briefly about these medications. For antibiotics, uh, topical antibiotics, uh, if they have an, an infection, systemic antibiotics, if they're, you know, if you need to get an IV for them uh, to treat systemic problems. Um, typically, they don't give prophylactic antibiotics. Unless patients have recurrent cellulitis, they might um, give, give these patients prophylactic uh, antibiotics. Um, diuretics may help in the early stage for, um, for edema. Um, so, you know, usually these patients are not going to be having routine diuretics unless they have a comorbid condition. Maybe they um, have uh, congestive heart failure and they need to keep taking the diuretics. Um, the diuretics, you know, they increase the uh, interstitial osmotic pressure, which increases the edema. So only if the patient needs to be on them will we continue with the diuretics. Um, dietary supplements, um, this is something that they've tried Coumarin, um, bioflavonoids, but they haven't seemed to work very well. Um, there's some other um, there's some other things out there, but there's no scientific evidence yet. So there's nothing really that has a diet. There's no real dietary supplement that you can take for lymphedema. Diet for lymphedema. Um, there's no evidence that shows there's any specific diet that helps, um, but some people, they feel that be, because there's a high protein in their, um, in their fluid that they want, and they've read about that, they might want to say, oh, we'll go on a low protein diet, or they might say they're going to they're, they're decrease their fluid intake, but that's not really shown to be effective. Um, the best approach is for the patient to be aware of their weight and weight control uh, with a low fat, high fiber diet. Um, and, and taking enough water. Um, so uh, we'll just, we touched on this last time a little bit, uh, pneumatic compression pumps. There's controversy about whether we should be using them or not. 
some sh studies are showing a benefit with these pumps. Um, the clinical results are often disappointing, though. Um, the, the concern is that um, it, it ignores the proximal congestion that you get from using these pumps. Um, it's not very effective on fibrotic tissue and the risk of proximal and, or, and, and getting genital swelling. There are, um, there are some newer compression pumps in the U.S. One is called a FlexiTouch, and it addresses some of this abdominal or proximal swelling that occurs. <laughs> Um, and the flexi touch is something that you know um, some insurances will pay for, but uh, basically it's a it's a system whereby it it, it really follows how we do our manual lymph drainage. Um, it's going to do a more proximal uh, compression first, and then move from proximal to distal, and then oftentimes the leg will be at the very end, and then it'll start coming back up and into the um, into the abdominal area again. So it it's more mimicking the manual lymph drainage that we do, which is why patients are seeming to say it works better. Um, but if you are going to do compression pumps, then you should, it should only be done in conjunction with your manual lymph drainage. Um, you know, after you've done some manual lymph drainage, then perhaps you have uh, openings in your lymphatic system and the pumps can, can work then. Um, last time we talked a little bit about... Um, surgical treatment of lymphedema. There are some um, surgeries out there, but they're not very successful. Uh, there are some co complications with it. Um, there's some specialized liposuction treatments, um, but they're going to still need continued long-term compression. Uh, plastic surgery, sometimes if the patient has lost a lot of uh, fluid volume, then they might have some extra skin fold. Oh, okay. Sorry, Is this Fatuma? Sorry, I can't hear you. Yeah, I'm on, but I can't hear you properly now. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not sure. Um, Nairobi, okay. now, now, you're, now. now it's better? Okay. Um, now it's better, yeah. Okay, welcome. Um, complications of lymphedema, recurrent infections, skin and tissue changes. Um, we'll talk about axillary web syndrome, uh, the pain, and psychologically uh, how it affects them. Um, and you can, you know, we can uh, quickly go through these different conditions. Cellulitis is very common. Uh, it's mainly group A strep that uh, is occurring, uh, bacterial infection. There's going to be patchy and diffuse redness and warmth, discomfort, very painful. Uh, they might have fever and achiness, their whole body. Um, this is a, you know, really quickly you want to you wanna, um, get these people over to the doctor and get on uh, antibiotics. Um, if they have breast cellulitis, you want to rule out inflammatory breast cancer. Uh, erysipelas is also a, a group A streptococcal infection, um, and you'll see marked involvement of cutaneous lymphatic vessels, more like clear uh, edges, sharp edges of the infection. Um, they'll still show that they're, they're warm and painful. They might have a fever. This might cause lymphatic thrombosis and scarring. Um, so treatment for cellulitis and erysipelas, um, you're going you, you, to have your, uh, your uh, antibiotics started right away, erythromycin or the other, the other ones. Um, but, if, you know, if a patient is, just has an un, uh, uncomplicated cuts or scratches, we're not going to start them on antibiotics. Um, and, again, we talked about... You know, for frequent in infections, they, they might be on daily long-term low-dose antibiotics or uh, <laughs> benzathine penicillin. Fungal infections, um, they live on the skin, usually warm, moist areas. So when we're doing our bandaging and uh, we want to have these patients, you know, wash their bandages frequently because the moisture from our skin is being absorbed into those bandages and uh, we have an underlayer that we can change out and wash frequently. Um, fungal infections will cause redness and maceration, peeling, cracking of the skin. 
and that just increases our, the risk of cellulitis. Um, so, you know, we want to keep the area dry, uh, make sure the patient understands hygiene. Um, if they do have a fungal infection, there are antifungal creams that they can get or, or oral antifungals. Um, skin care, foot care is very important. Um, Urea-based creams, ammonium, um, and, you know, we, they might have to get debridement done of any calluses or dry skin. Uh, using a sponge or washcloth, um, they might want to. You might want to talk to the podiatrist for nail care. Um, these patients, you know, you want to be careful with who, who's cutting their nails. Uh, we don't want them to have their cuticles cut. Uh, we want to make sure they don't have sharp edges and any any cuts in their skin. Um, for shoes, uh, typically, you know, you want to make sure they're not wearing too tight shoes, uh, footwear. Uh, sometimes the uh, Lace-up shoes are better um, because they provide some um, balance protection. The patient feels more secure, and they're, uh, you know, they can control how tight they make that. So um, we'll just really quickly look uh, in your handout at one second here. Any questions so far? So rec uh, in your handout, I added at the back some skin care um, that's very important to talk to the patient about with as part of CDT. Um, and I just we just talked about uh, some footwear. Avoid walking barefoot in public places. Um, you know, they can get athlete's foot if they do that. Always wearing clean, dry socks. They don't want to get excessive sweating like during exercise. They want to wash and dry their feet, especially between their toes. Um, and change their socks. Um, if they have blisters, you want to get them to apply band-aids right away. Um, if they have dry skin, applying lotions and creams um, very um, regularly. Don't put it, not putting lotion and cream between their toes. You don't want to have too much moisture in there. Uh, avoid wearing uh, exercise shoes all day. Um, we don't want to have a lot of moisture again. Um, Slippers or socks at home. Again, you want to cover the keep basically keep your feet dry. Uh, for, for nail care, you want to keep the toenails trimmed and short uh, so that they don't uh, snag and, and give you scratches between your toes. Um, you don't want to uh, you want to make sure that they're taken care of properly by someone who knows how to do a po um, a proper uh, uh, toe toe and nail care. Um, you know, you want to have them ask if they're getting pedicures done or manicures, making sure that they don't cut the cuticles. Um, this can lead to uh, injury or cuts in the skin. Um, and that just makes them more prone to getting a cellulitis or an infection. So um, they might need to use um, uh, medicated powder. Um, this is talking about Jason Talcree uh, powder. Uh, uh, Applying over-the-counter <laughs> antifungal medications if, if they suspect a fungal infection. Um, just using, uh, keeping their feet dry at all times. And during radiation therapy, um, if it's for breast cancer, that you want you want to have them avoid avoid wearing underwire bras uh, under the breast, um, and just following the skincare routine that the radio radiation oncologist will give them. And you're not applying lotions or oils to uh, radiation field before the radiation treatment. <clears throat> As for MLD, we're going to, you know, really avoid the ira uh, radiated tissue, if it, especially if it's painful. Okay, so any other questions um, regarding this? We're coming towards the end of our time. Uh, we went through three of the... Three of the modules, we did not get to the exercise. Uh, I'm not going to start that because it's quite long, um, and hopefully we can cover it next time. Um, does anyone have any questions for me or any, um, any questions about the training at all? Yes, I got information about uh, the accommodation being arranged by Nairobi, but I've not known how to reach Nairobi. Okay. Nairobi. Uh, sorry, which kind of what? 
the transportation to Nairobi from Kisumu, we, I did not discuss and get the information. I'm told the accommodation is already arranged, but the tra how to how to move to Nairobi has not been clear. Okay, um, so we're going to be arranging your flight for you. Um, did you get an email from Nishi? Um, we need some document information from you, Toto. Um, did you get that email from Nishi? No, I didn't get that. <laughs> okay. So, um, and do you have a WhatsApp uh, contact number or do you have a cell phone? I have a cell phone. Can you uh, just um, tell me the number, please? 0715. 0715. 42. Okay. 43. Uh huh. 14. 0715 42 Yes. Okay, so um, we'll just send you a, a we'll send you a WhatsApp a message and another email. Um, Toto, once we get the information from you with your uh, document information, then we can book the flight from Kisumu to Nairobi, and um, and then uh, we'll send you the information about when that when that is happening. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and uh, was Dr. Ula able to join you? I'm not very sure unless I consult with him. Uh, sorry, no, I meant...